This is a production of Cornell University Library. Thank you. All right, great. So um, I wanted to start by just introducing you to a few civic ecology practices to get an idea for what they are, and also hopefully why I'm so passionate about them. So the first one that I was introduced to was community gardening in New York City. And I don't know how many of you have been to uh, dynamic community gardens like in the city or Houston or just big cities wherever I go, Toronto. And I really love them because, for one, they're very diverse. So this is, I think this gentleman's from Mexico, but basically he's bringing his practices. He's brought seeds probably with him when he immigrated. And he's growing them in the Bronx in this case. And then he has an after-school program of young people that are coming and learning from him, as well as learning the science right there in their own neighborhoods. This is another one. This is on the Bronx River, oyster restoration projects, um, where we have young people and citizens helping scientists to restore oysters into the New York estuary. This one you probably recognize if you've been here for longer, since before they had those fences there. So um, we had a student group, Friends of the Gorge, and we did rest trail restoration, actually, right down here in Fall Creek Gorge. And so this is a little dated photo. But um, again, another practice where just sort of a grassroots or volunteer community practice to restore um, nature and restore some of the services that nature offers. So when I travel, I usually like to go and um, see if I can visit a community garden. Or this one, this one, actually, I got to actually help out with an actual practice. This was in Miami. I was down there giving a talk. And then I, I searched, because there's no light. Like, you can't really search civic ecology. But I searched for different organizations. And I found one that was having an invasive species removal project that weekend at a state park in Miami. And uh, we're removing Burma grass. We're not removing those Burmese uh, pythons, thank God. <laughs> Just Burma grass. But um, so, you know, it's a chance to get to meet people and see what, kind of what the civic engagement is in a particular community. And then this one, um, right here in Ithaca, Friends of Ithaca City Cemetery. And about twice a year, we do cleanups of the cemetery. We prune trees, drag, you know, fallen branches away. And then this is really unique because we also restore some of the gravestones because the older ones, you can't see them anymore, and there's some special solvents or whatever they are, I don't know, where they, um, you can clean them so that we can actually read the, the engravings. And oh, just as an advertisement, our next cleanup <laughs> is in a couple, no, it's in a, a month or two, a month and a half, Memorial Day weekend. So come on down, and the cool thing is that after the cleanup, you get a free tour of the city cemetery, and the, the, the oldest gravestones there are from the 1700s, and there's actually some gravestones of slaves, so it's really, really interesting to get a tour. So come on out. Okay. And then, um, so we had all these practices, and then the first book that my colleague Keith Tidball and I wrote was with MIT Press called Civic Ecology, Adaptation and Transformation from the Ground Up. And basically what we did was we started, tried to distill what's common amongst all these principles, like what's motivating people to be involved, uh, what are some of the outcomes, social and ecological. And we put them all in 10 principles, which are the organization of these books. So one, one chapter per principle. And then I was really fortunate that I got some funding from Cornell University to do a MOOC. So I was thinking about it. You know, if you've ever thought about MOOCs and books or books. And, anyway, um, but so MOOCs, for those of you who don't know, is a massive open online course. And for that one, I think we had about 4,000 uh, students register. And uh, so the name of the MOOC was Reclaiming Broken Places because the publicity people at edX Edge decided civic ecology wouldn't attract anybody. But anyway, Reclaiming Broken Places is an introduction to civic ecology. So I have the book, I have the MOOC, and, and I'm constantly thinking, like, these are really, really small practices, right? Like one little block for a community garden or a cleanup of a, a small local cemetery. And we know that there's just, you know, tremendous problems that are facing us. This is a recent flooding in Madagascar, uh, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. Um, so I'm constantly struggling, do these practices make any difference? Because I really, really enjoy volunteering and 
reading and sort of thinking about these practices and writing, but I realize there's sort of a disconnect there. So you can see it's kind of like, you, you know, you sort of feel like you're on an island with a little bit of green, but all around you is the sharks of the climate change or the rising sea level, whatever. So it presents a dilemma. So this is why I wanted to write the second book, or I edited it, um, that really focuses on the broader impact. So we have these little tiny practices, and is there any way they can scale up to have a broader impact? That's the question that we wanted to answer. And to do that, I put together teams. So each team had a practitioner, so somebody who was involved in the civic ecology practice, and an academic. And the idea was that the academic would apply some sort of conceptual lens or theoretical lens to the particular practice. And that together, they would co-author book chapters of this book. So none of these people had met each other. The practitioners that I paired that I thought would do well with the particular academics, they hadn't met each other. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with CESINC or the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center. It's in Annapolis. It's an NSF-funded center. And you can apply for them, unfortunately not for big grants, but they do fund uh, workshops. So they'll fund the travel expenses, and, and they'll fund your lodging, et cetera, your food. If you put together a workshop, they like them to be interdisciplinary and people that aren't already working together, and then you're supposed to produce a product afterwards. So we got some support to bring all these people together to CESINC in Annapolis. It's a really nice facility. And um, David Maddox, who actually, I don't know if any of you remember him. He got, he got a PhD from EEMB about probably the time I got my PhD. And um, so he facilitated our workshop. He runs this organization called the Nature of Cities now in New York, but it's a global site where he basically condenses writing about the nature of cities, and he's doing a workshop soon in Paris. So David, he um, put together, I'm gonna, so what he did was, there we go, he put together a, he basically put together a short video and he recorded these different practitioners and academics and he just asked them to find civic ecology. What does it mean to you? So I'm gonna play about four and a half minutes, there's maybe about six or seven people, so that you get a feel for some of the characters that showed up at this workshop. So to me, civic ecology is about community-based natural resource management that helps expose people and engage people in the idea of a land ethic, the Leopoldian, Aldo Leopold's idea of a land ethic. And that includes uh, thinking about the community as more than just the people in the neighborhood or the people on the block. It includes the other uh, life, the, from the soil to the birds to the bees and the wildlife, the trees, the atmosphere. All of that is the community that we live in. So civic ecology for me is this community-based natural resource management that leads to both civic, social sorts of outcomes that are positive or desirable and ecological outcomes that are positive or desirable. And those sort of civic ecology outcomes should be meaningful, they should be memorable, and most importantly, they should be measurable. Uh, I see civic ecology as activity that connect people to nature and also help people to build a sense of community and social capital together. Civic ecology to me is restoring the natural landscape to create spaces for which people can heal and rejuvenate. When I think about civic ecology, I really think about the process of an individual community deciding what matters to it in terms of its own ecology, the ecology of its neighborhood, the ecology of its neighbors, and figuring out what it can do on its own as a community to make those ecological objectives happen and become reality. At the Greening of Detroit, we really think it's part of our job to create opportunities for those folks to see that reality happen in real time. One of my favorite projects was a project where we, we talked with kids about what they might like to see in the vacant space in their neighborhood. They envisioned a little pocket park. All they really wanted was a slide. 
and we created a five-year plan to make the pocket park happen and someone got excited about that brought funding and resources to the project and we were made, able to make that project happen in about a six month time frame. What was great about it is that the same kids who were little when they envisioned that pocket park, that slide they wanted, were still little enough to slide down the slide once it got built. That is kind of civic ecology in action. That is a community taking hold of a space that was important to it and making it something that worked for itself and making the ecosystem better as a result. My definition of civic ecology, or what I, I think about um, uh, when we use that term, is people taking action for themselves, um, and in that action, thinking uh, beyond themselves, and thinking about all the different um, issues that are important to a community, to a place, and beyond. And when I think of civic ecology, I think of it as a framework to help um, describe many of the things that we're doing in our neighborhood and community, including tending to trash in our stream, um, planting native plants, working with kids, educating them about the environment, and just trying to live in a more sustainable way with others in our neighborhood. When I think of civic ecology, I think about engagement of people in their natural environment. That can be everything from in their community park to a local beach to a forest preserve. I think about science and nature, people and nurturing of their environment, coming together, hands-on learning, multi-generational. I think about no books, no science books no homework, just life work in the environment. What is civic ecology to me? So, uh, when we remember that we are species, it is, uh, that is ecology. When we remember it together with people, it is civic. And to realize both, uh, is through our practice, then it is practicing civic ecology. Yeah. Okay, you don't need to hear me. <laughs> um, and now I can think. Oh, I think it works. I think so. Okay, so now you get an idea of some of the characters that were there. Anyways, it was a pretty interesting group, as you can see. And then we, had, we left this workshop and we had to write our chapters, right? They hadn't met each other for, I can't remember, it was two or three days. So um, now we were getting down to the real work. And so um, how many of you uh, saw the newspaper this morning and Julian Assange walking out? Did you see the photos? Did you notice that seven years ago he looked a little different than before he went into the Ecuadorian embassy? Well, that's kind of like the way I felt like before and after writing this book. So, and um, well, hopefully I don't, you know, didn't change in appearance that as much as he did. It was only three years instead of seven years, but you get the idea. So, I mean, I think it was a really, really challenging assignment for these people because one, a practitioner and an academic trying to write together. Two, they didn't really know each other. Three, I mean, I don't know how many of you edited a book before, but once, I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot worse than hurting cats, like I'd rather hurt 100 cats. Um, so it was difficult, but we eventually accomplished our goal. And I just wanted to uh, give you just a little idea of what's in the book. So basically, as I edited the book and sort of we're finishing it up, and I'm having to synthesize this, Three themes really emerged about how these practices could scale up to be something, have a broader impact. So the first theme was um, culture build, excuse me, culture building. And I will go into one or two examples of the, each of the three themes, but I, I'm not going to go into the example of Veronica's book, but you saw Veronica, the African-American woman who works at Faith in Place, which is a nonprofit in Chicago. And her, just as an example, her partner was um, 
Laurel Kearns, who's a religious studies uh, professor at Drew University in New Jersey. And um, I really like their chapter because Veronica has, she does a very interesting program in Chicago. So basically, because she's working with African American and Latino audiences mostly, and so she tries to have them talk about their stories of migration, her family's from Alabama, and how they migrated to Chicago, to the industrial north, or you know, from Latin America, but mostly from um, rural so southern states and the African American migration. And then she has this uh, um, monarch butterfly program. So she tries to get people to plant milkweed for the butterfly and to relate the migration story of the butterfly and how we need to welcome the butterfly just as people welcomed us when we moved to Chicago. The next theme is knowledge building. And we have three chapters there. And then the last one is movement building. So like social movements. So the three themes, culture building, knowledge building, and movement building. And I will uh, give, as I mentioned, an example of each one. So this is one in culture building that I also found very interesting. So basically, the two authors are Kareem Kassam, who's in the Department of Natural Resources here. He was the academic. And then Z Zara Galshani, who was, you saw her. She was the woman with the um, headscarf in the um, video. She's Ira Iranian American, but she goes back to Iran quite a bit. So she, when she went back to Iran, she came across this group, Nature Cleaners. And they're a group that was started by a gentleman who, um, he had lived in Germany, I think, for 30 years. He had spent his working life in Germany. Then he went back to Iran. When he came back, he went to some of the sites that he had gone as a young child, and they were totally trashed out. So he decided he's going to pick up trash. And then, because of, I think it's Telegram that they use, not Facebook in Iran, uh, but basically the, the local version of Facebook, um, this practice went viral, and eventually he had civic groups in all of the states, I think there's 30-some or something in Iran, that were doing this practice, that were chapters of nature cleaners. So they go and do litter cleanups in public spaces. So when Zara... Just a minute, I'm going to get a little drink of water here. So she, when she went and did some volunteer cleanups with this group, she would interview some of the people in the group. And one of the things that uh, one of the leaders said was that their mo main motivation is, she's, ta they're, she's talking, this uh, leader is talking about the volunteers, their main motivation is firing Sazi, and of course I don't speak Parsi, so I have no idea <laughs> exactly how you pronounce it, but... So when they wrote this chapter, they had this interesting quote here, but they hadn't really, um, so this is just because I'm trying to balance a little bit, telling you a little bit the process of writing the book as well as what's in the book. But they hadn't, um, you know, Kareem had, uh, Dr. Kazam had applied his theoretical lens, but it, or conceptual lens, but it wasn't really about Faring Sazi. So I said, well, this is interesting. I wonder what it is. So I, actually, there's a book in Man Library that I found on Faring Sazi. And it's government-directed campaigns to change culture. So the examples that they used, or that I read about, were um, one was uh, birth control, so family planning, family size. And apparently in one generation, because of a government sort of campaign, they, well, I think it was also because of urbanizations, so they went from over seven children per family to, I think, just over two children per family. So huge change in culture in one generation. And the other case that was really interesting is Iran either had, I'm not sure if this government campaign was so successful, or it has still um, one of the highest car accident rates in the world. And so they uh, had a government-directed campaign to try to make people drive more courteously and safely. And so that was called Farang Sazi also. But I thought it was interesting because these are both sort of heavily government-directed campaigns that the term had been used for, but these volunteers are saying, we're going to change the culture, essentially, through these litter cleanups. And, and they're talking about a sort of culture of caring for public spaces, of cleanliness. Um, and, and those are sort of the, the, the way that they were thinking about this. OK, knowledge building. This is an uh, author from Columbia. And then the academic is Arjen Bals from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. But the practice 
apparently in Bogota, they do a lot of kind of um, seed saving, native seeds, kind of you know, food, native indigenous food type activities and seed exchanges. And then once a year, there's this group that gets everybody together from across Colombia that's doing similar types of activity, and they have a weekend-long workshop. Or, no, I think it's a week-long workshop. And so basically why I'm calling this knowledge building is because it's a chance for everybody who's doing these similar sorts of practices to exchange practices and learn from each other. They also do a practice locally while they're there, so they get all experience doing something together. This is why this, the slide of tree planting is part of the workshop. And then the third one is movement building. So has anybody been to this site? Nobody? Are you sure? <laughs> OK. Um, that was a trick question, because this part is not yet built. <laughs> so. Um, but this part, the bridge, the Anacostia Bridge, I'm not sure which one it is, but that's there. But what happened was that there, this was the former bridge. This is a rendition. But you can see the pillars, which are real. So the bridge, they took it down, all except for the pillars. And then this group, this citizens group, they got together and they said, well, we want to create this amazing park that would unite those two sides of the Anacostia River, which is pretty symbolic in terms of class and race, et cetera, in, in BC. But um, so, I mean, this is not really a grassroots, it's kind of a grassroots group. It's not a government group, but they've obviously raised a lot of money because they've hired some very high-end design firms to make the design, and they're trying to raise the money to build this, what, what will be the 11th Street Bridge Park. So I put this under movement building because if I asked how many of you have been to Highline, I'd probably get a lot of people saying they've been to Highline in New York City. Is anybody not familiar with what Highline is? So... Have you been there, Braven? No. Do you know what it is? It's, a, it's again, it's derelict infrastructure, right? So it's, in this case, it's an elevated railway that was falling apart. They're going to take it down. And then a citizens group got together. They raised tons of money. And they built this beautiful um, linear park on the old railroad site in the city. Um, so when I was talking to the people involved in the 11th Street Bridge Park, they said that there's now actually a network of people that are doing these kinds of projects. There's one in Chicago, too. They're doing a rails to trails project in the city of Chicago. So there's a lot of these. And what they're basically trying to do is learn from Highline the lessons they learned about gentrification. Because it was, you know, if you've been to Highline, there was massive, massive gentrification around High lines, which a lot of it was probably a result of having this wonderful green infrastructure in the community. And they're very concerned about what's going to happen with 11th Street Bridge Project and trying to do a lot of community organizing to present that, prevent that same scenario. OK, so I, want, I have one other practice to share under movement building. This one is the Ugly Indian. You can, um, they're just www.theuglyindian.com. They, sorry, sorry, Javed. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you've never heard of him before, and are, which is maybe good. No. Um, you saw actually Anna Ruda who, in the film. He was the last person I did, who's the guy from The Ugly Indian, and I was actually the co author with him. So um, basically, this is a bunch of guys that are um, sort of the new, you know, 30 ish, well educated, master's degree class of Indians who live in cities, and they don't want to live with these kinds of public spaces, which are very common in India, or at least they were when I was there, which is probably about 10 years ago. Um, and so they organized this group, The Ugly Indian. They, they have a great website. You can go there. And they have a strong Facebook presence. And they do what they call spot fixes. So they just get everybody out there through social media. And in three hours, they convert what's on the left to what's on the right. You can see that it's the same site, right? You see the same wall. They paint it. Javid, I don't know if this is true, but what they've told me is that they painted that color because it's a neutral color amongst all the cultures or religions in India, and also because people chew um, what I call be be beetle juice or beetle nut. You guys know what? There's another name for it. Pond. Yeah. And has anybody ever seen somebody chewing beetle nut? Ruth. And what is like, what's sort of dripping down her chin when she's chewing? Oh, it's spitting down. 
Yeah. So yeah, when I first saw somebody chewing whatever they were doing, I thought they were bleeding like profusely from their mouth. But anyways, they do spit it, so they make they have stains. So that's why they're the second reason they're using this color. All right. So, um, oh, so I wanted to say about the ugly Indian. There's a bunch of things that are interesting about them. One is that they, and this has to do with scaling up their impact. So. They try to plan these, they call them spot fixes. And they plan them one near either the homes of uh, famous rugby players, famous Bollywood actors and actresses, and government buildings. And so the idea is that they're going to, I'll just cover the government buildings part. They're going to embarrass the government because the government is not taking care of these spaces, which they believe the government should be. So if they put these near a government building, then they think they're going to embarrass the government, and then maybe some, they'll start taking some responsibility for these spaces. And they've actually had some success, at least. What's happened a lot now is that you can see it here. This was actually right an hour ago when I was doing some last minute um, Facebook searching or whatever, visiting Facebook before I came over here. Anna Ruta just posted that. Um, They've now done 12 underpasses. So what happens is the government now, I don't know if they pay them or they must, but they've actually enlisted the ugly Indian to do a lot of these beautification. This one doesn't have green elements. Sometimes they do some plantings with them. But you can see a space that you can see a little bit that you know, would look like this. They're trying to convert here. And I don't know. Do you know, Javed, if that blue and white has any meaning or? Yeah, OK. Um, but this, like. They have a different model than nature cleaners in that they don't want chapters in different cities. They want people to do this, but they don't want them to call themselves the ugly Indian because they're very afraid that somebody will use their name and then do some kind of thing that really pisses somebody off and they get a bad reputation. And so their different chapters will be called like um, you know, Mumbai Rising or something like that, not the ugly Indian. But they have spread widely, and actually, they have some practices in Pakistan now that are copying them. And so, um, and it's all kind of mediated and, and I think, motive, get people out there through social media. And you saw before that if you do one of these, you post what it looks like before, and then you post what it looks like after. So there's sort of a visual, a big visual component. So not that you want to read all this, um, but this is just to let you know that there is something, some content in the book. And this was from the Ugly Indian chapter. And this one was really interesting because, for me anyway, as I worked on it, I had to do a lot of reading of different literatures because I'm trying to figure out, is this a practice? So they call it a practice. It's, they call it, as I mentioned, a spot fix, clean up a spot or fix a spot. Is it an organization? Well, not really. They don't have a building. They don't, all these guys, they have supposedly about five people that are running this organization that are all like Anaruda. The way I understood it, they're, as I mentioned, they're sort of um, well-educated people. They have some design background. But they're anonymous. And so they're, the idea is they don't want anyone to take credit for this. Like they have five people in their you know, group that's organizing this. And they don't want one guy to get out ahead. Um, and even for Anna Ruta to come, it was, it was very difficult. You know, he had a, because they'd never had one person get this much visibility. Um, and then the last thing, is it a movement or is it a social movement? And I don't know, but one of the things I ran across when I was looking at social movements is the whole idea of connective action and the idea that because of social media, the form of social movements is very different than it was previous to social media. So that a lot of the sort of memes and, and what we're calling ourselves, they emerge from people that are in the practice. Um, the example, one example that's commonly used is I am the 1% from um, the Occupy movement. That came from, they just threw it out there and said, somebody tell us you know, what we should call ourselves. And it came out from somebody who, who wrote back and said, I have diabetes. I can't, you know, um, I can't go to college. And I'm, you know, I'm, not the, I'm like the 99% or I'm not the 1% or whatever. Can't afford to buy my medicine. Anyway, so, and, you know, and obviously they're using very clever things like we're all ugly Indians, we're all responsible for this. But the idea is that these are movements that are very much mediated and even sort of framed by social media and by the people that are practicing or that are part of them. Okay, so 
Um, you know, the question is, I do, did we sort of come up with some broader impacts of these practices? And I think we came up with some possible pathways to broader impacts. And I've discussed them through the knowledge build, building, culture building, and movement building. I also think it's interesting to think about the, the model of having practitioners and academics write together and what that means, especially for the practitioners. I already told you what it means for the academics. Um, difficult, but so about a week ago, I get this email from Anna Ruta again from the Ugly Indian, and he says, The Ugly Indian chapter in the book, Grassroots to Global, is being referred to by many as an essential read for the researchers and government authorities in India. He says, notably researchers from the University of Minnesota, University of Washington, Harvard, and researchers in New Zealand, apart from the people in India who have wrote back to us about the book and chapter. And recently, we had a great fortune to host a highly acclaimed person in the field of design and design thinking from UC San Diego. And this person finds the book in our chapter to be an excellent read and wants to implement some principles in San Diego. So they're very happy about this achievement. So, you know, nobody's like coming to me and telling me it's a great read and that they're going to use it and et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, it's nice to hear from them. But I think what this is really saying, you know, I don't know if I take literally all this great fortune that they had, but for him, it is a way, I mean, I, I think, and you, you know, you guys, my uh, colleagues here have done these online courses when you, when you write with practitioners, when you work with practitioners, it's sort of, because Cornell has an international reputation, it really validates what they're doing, I think, to have us be interested in what they're doing. OK. So have I solved my dilemma? I don't think so. <laughs> if anybody has, let me know. But I do want to just comment on where I'm going, briefly, where I'm going from here. So I'm, I have this new project that Mary mentioned at the beginning, the Cornell uh, Climate Online Fellows. And here, we're not focusing on civic ecology practices per se. It's more individual action and can we scale up our individual action through our social networks. Um, so that's the question. Is there a place for individual action? There's been some um, interesting articles. There was one in The Guardian about a boycott of Barclays Bank. And uh, the person made the argument that if people take individual action, like if we buy our individual climate offsets for our airfare, if we do a vegetarian diet or something, we're blaming ourselves for this cr climate crisis, and it's not our fault. It's really the oil company's fault, and it's the big bank's fault. So we should be blaming them, putting all, all our energies there, and not us. And, and if you, uh, any of you listen to the podcast Drilled, which is about the disinformation campaign from Exxon and the other big oil companies, makes the same argument. It's the oil companies, their disinformation campaign. We should not be blaming ourselves and doing these little things like you know, going vegan or, or whatever we're doing, eating impossible burgers. I don't know if anybody's tried them yet. They're not bad. OK. So, um, so, excuse me, I'm getting a little dry mouth, but um, we have uh, 35 fellows, as Mary mentioned, from 26 countries. And this is where, I think this is, yeah, so you can see them. So um, they're, actually, it's just been amazing, because I'm working with these guys over 12 weeks, we communicate online, you know, not in real time, but once a week we have a webinar. Um, usually about 30 of them make it. This morning we had it, a fewer people made it. They all, a bunch of them writing me that they're sick. Um, so, but it's, you know, we've been doing this for eight weeks, so I expect a little, uh, you know, decline in the, in the amount of participation. But it's, and it's, Pretty amazing that you know we're getting usually for about seven weeks we've gotten about thirty people out of this thirty five because the time zones is not convenient for everybody. So one person that has only made it about once just to, I just wanted to introduce you a few people so you can see how diverse they are. Is this guy? Sorry, there's a problem that this cut off, but you can kind of well I I can show you the field. Don't. What? Like, this guy's a high school student. He lives in a suburb of Vancouver. I don't know why he has so many books. But anyways, <laughs> um, 
So this guy, this is Ted, Ted Jeep, and his climate action that he's going to do, and he's actually going to do a um, plant-rich diet, and I think he's going to work on food waste. So he's doing it through some environmental clubs in his high school. Um, yeah, I can go back and just. I mean, the amazing thing I'm just going to show you is we have somebody from Yemen. Um, his name's Omar. He's actually been, he's been, I can't understand if he really has a job right now, but he's working, he's worked with a, a human, um, uh, what am I trying to say, like human rights with the UN, basically. Um, and some of these guys take you so seriously because really they're not paying and so there's no grade, right? There, there's, I'm, I have no power over them. But he wanted to do a climate action, I can't remember what it was. And then this week he wrote me, and it was actually kind of sad, but, but I mean very sad because a child had picked up a landmine on the way to school, and it had exploded, and the child had died. And he had said, I've been wanting to work on landmines, you know, because he was in one of our online courses. And then I stopped working on it because it's been too dangerous to work on that issue politically. And, but now that this happened with this child, I have to work on landmines. And he relates it to climate because of the weather patterns, the flooding, it, it exposes the landmines more, and then more people, like children, are likely to pick them up. Is that, did I get that right, Annie? Because Annie has no, known him also. So this is just an example of one of our fellows. And, and then, let's see, who else will I do? Of oh, this. I'm going to do, see if I can get Bianca. Yeah, so this is Bianca. She's from Kenya, and she's worked with all these UN, like um, Article 6 of the Paris Accords. So basically, what she does is she works with a program where the EU is buying offsets from Kenya. And so the Ken Kenyans are supposed to do, like, solar energy or any projects, and then the EU gets credit for it. And, um, you know, a lot of times these things are really criticized because are they taking advantage? Are the Kenyans really benefiting? But she's, as a consultant, she works to try to make sure that these things work for both the EU and Kenya. So some of these guys are really high capacity, and they're a lot higher capacity than I have. They've worked globally on all these different issues, and it's just been really fun to meet them. Okay. And... Everything goes right. Let's see. This is where I think I'm going to need some help because I don't see two copies of the thing. Thank you. You're welcome. There's only a few more slides, so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, look at. So I decided because I was making, oh, so basically I forgot to say, but, well, I mentioned with Tajib, they're choosing an action and then they're doing it in their network, right? So it could be their Instagram followers or it could be people in their school like Tajib is doing. So as several of you know, I decided to do one too and try to convince my network, which basically people in my building, and I really wish I would have chosen a social network because it's so much more anonymous than trying to knock on somebody's door and say, uh, Jim, did you remember to buy those carbon offsets that you promised me you'd buy me for that next air flight? Uh, Krasny, I thought I had a month to do this. Why are you bugging me right now? <laughs> so, um, but, so, yeah, I chose this Finger Lakes Climate Fund. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but to give them a plug, they're really a cool organization. They're local. And I think, you know, what? it's been interesting. I've talked to a lot of people in Fernal, and what they really like is that the money is spent locally to help people weatherize their homes. So it's not going to, you know, like the Amazon forest or something where you feel like, well, how's it really being spent? And uh, we have a team, Fernal and friends. Thank you, Dr. Shabbat, for joining our team today. He only took one email. He was very convincible. <laughs> That's because he's been a leader in carbon offsets already on campus. But so we have 15 players. Um, we're number five. Anybody can join. In fact, I brought some flyers. <laughs> but after you join, after you, and you just, you know, you can either do a little donation or you can offset a trip that you might be taking. But um, after you join, don't forget to, after you pay, you'll have an option to um, join our team. So don't forget to contribute to our team. 
Inferno and Friends so that I can report back to my fellows that I had a very successful um, campaign of influencing my social network. We'll see. OK, so. <laughs> Well, you can make another one, Jim. I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> OK. So um, yeah, I think this is sort of a little bit about my search for meaning in life and how can my life be, or how can my life be meaningful. But um, I just wanted to thank the Mann Library in particular and Cornell University Press, who have been really great to work with, and Sessink. And then um, Engage Cornell hasn't funded this work, but I think they've done a lot of interesting thinking along these lines. And then finally, the great um, members of my lab over here who have contributed to all this work. So I think we have a little bit of time for questions. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.